Hi everyone, this is Colleen Hardigan from Madeira USA. Uh, happy to have you all here with us uh, to learn a little bit more about sublimation and how if you're an embroiderer it can bring more revenue uh, to your company and more customers uh, also so you won't have to uh, turn people away because it's uh, a way of decorating that you could not address. So um, uh, the Sawgrass Company and Jimmy Lamb are here to help explain the sublimation process and I'm here to talk about how it really does work with your embroidery business if you happen to have one. Our topic today growing your embroidery business with sublimation and um, as always uh, I am just thrilled to be involved with companies like Madeira who are getting involved into digital decoration through things like sublimation and being offered it to you their customers and uh, for those of you who know me you know that I started as an embroiderer and I still am involved with embroidery and digitizing um, though I also do a lot of digital types of things now in fact if you join Colleen and myself um, a few months ago, we did a webinar about actually using sublimation, uh, digital transfers, uh, using products like the Chroma Blast product that uh, uh, Madeira carries to be able to create some really unique applique products. Okay, so definitely digital printing can make a big impact in your embroidery business. But we're going to really go a little bit deeper today because you know. As Colleen was just saying, diversification can make all the difference in the world in, in really growing your business, especially in a competitive environment. In fact, taking that a step further, if you look at the economy, you know, you, your customer base may actually be spending less money with you now than maybe in the past, you know, buying the great embroidery that you already do. And the reality is they're, they're spending less money with everybody, but they're still spending money. So if they're going somewhere and they're getting let's say promotional products and you don't sell promotional products or you can't produce any then they're spending that money somewhere else or maybe they need some signage for their business they're spending that money somewhere else would it be nice if maybe you could capture some of that without having to spend a whole lot of money to do it you know I'm not talking about going out and buying DTG equipment that you know twenty five thousand dollars on up you know when you come to sublimation as we're going to talk about today it's a very low cost way to be able to do a lot of different new and unique products. Okay, so that's our goal to kind of introduce you to what it's all about. So let's get started here. So my first question, pretty much what Colleen was just saying, are you leaving money on the table? And that's what I mean by are your customers leaving with their wallet and taking some money and spending it elsewhere. You want to capture all that money that you possibly can from each and every customer. I mean, you already know that with embroidery. You're trying to do everything to do with embroidery, but what about all those other different things out there? And that's where diversification becomes the key. You know, I started in this business quite a few years back when it was all about specialization. You did something and you did it to the best of your ability, which you should always do anyway. But pretty much embroiderers did embroidery and screen printers did screen printing, you know, and, and that was kind of the world as we knew it back then, okay? But as things have progressed, we've moved away from so much specialization, and we're doing more and more diversification. And you don't want to be left out in the cold, because let me tell you something. If your competition down the street is able to do more products than you can, it may be that your embroidery customer is leaving you to go down there to get some of those other products. But if that other guy does embroidery as well, they might start getting their embroidery there too and never come back to you. Not a good idea you know, thing. So being versatile really can help out to grow your business the right way. So as an example. And I wanted to answer, go right ahead. Let me just add one thing. Um, we recently did a trade show in Atlantic City, and one of the things that we do as we talk to different attendees is talk about what, what they do. And more and more, uh, we see embroiderers looking at different ways to print, whether it's screen print or digital print or direct garment or transfer. You know, there are everyone is looking for uh, another way to keep those dollars in house and not let them go somewhere else. Uh, and I think that, like Jimmy said, this is this is a very when we get done, you'll see it's a very inexpensive way to fill some of this need. Go ahead. 
Yep. Okay, so as an embroiderer, there's a good chance you're probably already doing, say, schools and sports. If you're an embroiderer, you're probably already producing team apparel, staff shirts, school uniforms, and spirit wear for your customers because you have the ability to do that. You know, pretty much everything on the screen there, as you can see, has been embroidered, and that's great. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, you're making money. You're satisfying the needs of the customers. But have you ever thought about all the other things that the schools and sports organizations are actually buying and where they're going to actually get those things? Stuff like T-shirts. Can you do a T-shirt with embroidery? Well, you can embroider a T-shirt, but you can't print it. You know, um, action sports photos, very good up in the top right hand corner there for things like fundraisers for booster groups, um, promotional products at the school level, really considered more of a spirit items than anything else. You know, the car flags and all those neat things. Um, and, you know, that's one of the big ways to get into the schools anyway is to go through a fundraiser type of program. Okay, but back to the concept here. The schools are buying all these other things. They're just not necessarily buying them from you. And everything that you see on the screen right now was sublimated. That's what makes that unique. Sublimation does so many different things. It's a digital printing process, but it is uniquely applied to hundreds of different types of products, not necessarily apparel products. And that starts to separate it from some things like screen printing or direct-to-garment printing because those, again, are focused on fabric and apparel, whereas sublimation, we have so many more different things that we can do out there in the world. And But it doesn't just stop with schools and sports. What about corporate and small business? You know, with the corporate and small business world, you probably already got a piece of that. You know, you're doing, you know, different things. You're doing the briefcases and you're doing apparel and maybe you're doing some of the restaurants with the aprons. You're doing headwear. You're doing a wide variety of things. I mean, obviously, that's a good marketplace for the embroiderer. But when you start thinking about other things that they're actually buying that you can't do, you're actually missing out on some of the potential revenue streams that are out there. Again, everything you see on the screen has been sublimated. And we have, you know, on one extreme, we have things like, you know, simple as a mouse pad, but it becomes a promotional product. You're able to do awards. This is not engraved. This is actually sublimated. It's still a wooden plaque, but the surface is sublimatable because it was manufactured for that, and you're able to do full-color graphics to make a really nice award product. And it's very inexpensive. I mean, something like this particular award um product cost about six dollars as a blank this one has about uh, maybe 65 cents worth of ink and media cost so you have invested in that about seven dollars in materials cost but this is a type of thing that can sell for 25 or 30 dollars at a retail point so you can see that was inexpensive to produce the print time was about 30 seconds the heat press time was about a minute okay you had some more work you had to do but other than that. Right. So very quick setup, easy to do a single onesie or twosie at a pretty decent margin, you know, and we, we like margins. Those are good things. Well, positive margins are a good thing. Negative margins are not. Um, but you know what? Signage, name plates, just there's so many different things that we can do for that corporate marketplace. Imagine that when your customer came in to get polos, you're able to say, listen, do you have a need for some promotional products? Let me show you some things I can produce for you. What about signage? Does your sales staff need awards? I mean, there's just all these different things you can put out there in front of them, and that becomes a huge, huge factor. In fact, according to the Ask Specialty Institute, it takes six times more energy and effort to recruit a brand new customer than to service an existing customer. So think about that for a minute. If you were able to ask, suddenly do all these different types of things and you approached your existing customer base, you could go to every single one of them out there and probably immediately start generating new streams of revenue from at least 50% of them, as opposed to going and knocking on doors and getting new customers, which you're going to have to do anyway. But in the grand scheme of things, it's a quick way to actually pull more money out of your existing customer base by diversifying your business with you know, processes like sublimation. And not hurt your embroidery business besides. No, absolutely not, because that's not, I mean, you wouldn't do sublimation instead of embroidery. Right. You're just simply expanding the things that you can offer to that client. In addition. 
Yeah, absolutely. And the nice thing about embroidery and sublimation is they're so diversely different, such that they're good complements to each other. Because the fact is, what you do with embroidery is so totally unique. I mean, it can't be reproduced by any other system out there. You know, if you look at somebody who does direct to garment printing and screen printing, those two things are fairly similar. But when you look at like embroidery and sublimation, being so diverse, it just really broadens the range of what you can do. Right. You know, gifts and personalization, another very popular thing for embroiders. I mean, you're probably already doing things like, you know, monogrammed items, baby gifts, you know, the wonderful mom's gang, whatever. I mean, you're doing these things. You're making those personalized products for people, and they're paying you for it, we hope. Um, but, you know, take sublimation, and again, you go to a whole new level because one of the cool things with sublimation is you can do pictures of people. Now, what better way to personalize something than to put their picture on it or their pet's picture on there? Okay, I mean, you take something as simple as an ornament for a Christmas tree, and you put baby's first Christmas or Carla Ann's first Christmas or whatnot. I mean, and what you have there is you have captured a real live memory, and you preserved it forever. And that's huge. People pay a lot of money for that. And that's one of the things you definitely got to remember with sublimation is it's fantastic for reproducing pictures of people, pets, whatever you want to do. Okay? Um, and that just sets it apart again from everything else. So suddenly to compliment, you know, think about your baby gifts. What's one of the best baby gifts out there? And that is a receiving blanket that's been embroidered with the baby's name and the birthday. Great present. Okay? What if you could also add in some complimentary items so you approach that same family and say listen in addition to your receiving blanket you know we can make you know your first Christmas ornaments um, I don't have a picture up here but we have something that's called a digital um, birth certificate which is really a combination of the baby's picture information statistics about the baby the parents and whatever like you'd find on a birth certificate but usually also containing some really cutesy baby related graphics so it, it looks really nice and it's done on uh, a photo type of panel that sits like an easel on the bookshelf and those things man again six dollar investment those things sell for 30 35 bucks so now you have the receiving blanket you got the uh, digital um, birth certificate uh, you have some other you know commemorative products and you got a nice package and look how much more money you just generated you know by having that extra ability those are the things you got to think about so sublimation definitely can make a difference I mean that's what we're talking about here it's really a great way to get the best of both worlds you got the embroidery and you got the sublimation but I know that a lot of you don't know exactly what sublimation is well it's very unique Digital printing process. And I think, oh, okay. go right ahead, Colleen. No, no, no. And I was going to say, and the and the word kind of um, not scares people, but it's a different word. It's not a word that we're used to. What does it exactly mean? You know, what what does the word sublimation mean? How is that different from screen print or direct to garment printing? Um, I always think of it as the ability to put a graphic on hard goods, which you can't do with embroidery, although you can put sublimation on soft goods as well, and I know we're going to get into uh, the specifics of that. So, um, When you look at sublimation, the neat thing, first of all, is sublimation does not require a big, fancy, expensive piece of equipment. I mean, you already bought that with embroidery. You got, hopefully, a really good quality machine that really does what you want it to do. And you paid to get what you needed, and now you're generating income. That's great. You know, but you may not be ready to put the same investment into expansion that you did into your initial embroidery equipment. Understandable. So when you start looking at what sublimation requires, the sublimation that we're talking about, um, we define as desktop printing. So the idea being that everything fits on a desk. Well, a heat press is involved, and heat presses are known to be heavy, so if you have a flimsy desk, you probably don't want to put it there. But the concept being it's a small footprint, okay? Requires a computer, which you probably already have. Requires a heat press. In the case of doing round products like coffee mugs and water bottles, then you're probably going to invest in a mug press, but most of your stuff is flat, so it's a standard heat press, and a printer. Now you think, oh, yeah, there's the catch. That's one of those $15,000 or $25,000 
you know, DTG printers. Nope. Uh, it's really involving off the shelf uh, desktop office printers. Uh, certain printers, not all of them, are capable of handling and managing and processing sublimation inks. And uh, in this case, there are some Epson models and some Ricoh, with Ricoh probably being the most popular. So you're talking about printers that cost hundreds of dollars, not thousands of dollars. And basically, you're going to set up an image, and then you're going to print it out onto a sheet of special sublimation transfer paper. It's different from transfer paper used with, say, pigment inks for t-shirt transfers. You want to use sublimation transfer paper and sublimation inks. It's going to print out, and like at the Ricoh, and you see right here a Ricoh 3300, that can actually print out a full color 8 inch by 10 inch image in about 30 seconds or less. So you're going to print it out, and then you're going to put the item you're uh, decorating along with your transfer under a heat press and for about a minute, and then that's where all the magic begins. And, and keep in mind, this is very important. The image leaves the paper and goes on to the product being decorated, such that when you remove the heat press from the picture, you take the transfer paper, ball it up, and throw it away. This is not a decal that's put on with adhesive. The transfer paper is temporary. The ink, in the case of sublimation, is permanent. So let me tell you a little bit more about that, because sublimation is so unique um, because of the simple fact that it is a chemical molecular process, okay? But first, let's just talk a little bit about the characteristics of embroidery. I mean, embroidery is good stuff. Um, it's perceived as a high-value process. Uh, it's ideal method for embellishing caps, for example, and that's probably one of the best things. In my mind, the best way you can ever do a baseball cap is embroidery, okay? I've never found a way to do it any better than that. Uh, fiber content does not affect the process. These are things you should know because you see this every day. Uh, threads are color fast, especially Madeira threads, and typically don't fade. Uh, names and text can be created from a keyboard with no setup, quick and easy. That's important. But on the downside, okay, I was an embroiderer. I'm not slamming embroidery. Everything's got limitations, so does sublimation. But we know with embroidery, for example, that fabric texture affects sewing quality. We have to learn that when we digitize, you know, how to deal with that. You definitely have to be able to hoop or frame the garment. So, you know, if you can't get it in a hoop or frame or a clamp, you're not getting it on the machine. Uh, needle has to completely penetrate the fabric. So that starts to limit you on some cases of, of what we can actually deal with. Okay? Been there, done that. Broken many a needle. Uh, lengthy setup process. You got artwork. You got digitizing. So if you're going to do logos, you're going to take some time to get it all done. Okay? But that's okay. That's what we have to do. Typically limited to small designs, chest and cap. Now that's an important factor because in the world of embroidery today, a lot of people have kind of gotten boxed into a corner by what it is they can and can't do, you know, and that's why diversification kind of takes you out. I mean, I know some of you still get to do full fronts and backs, and that's pretty cool, but I don't see it as much as I used to, just changing the world. And, of course, your colors are limited to the number of needles on the machine, you know. Yes, I've done a 24-color design, but, you know, it's no fun because you've got to rethread the machine as you got. So embroidery's got great aspects, and then it's got some areas that yeah, may limit you a little bit, challenge you a little bit. That's okay. Everything else does, too. You know, when you look at sublimation, just as an example, because this is kind of introducing it to you because it's a, it's a little bit different process. Okay, it's a lot different. First of all, it will not fade when laundered. That's pretty cool. Embedded in the surface instead of on top. That makes it really unique. In fact, that makes it uniquely different from a lot of printing processes as well. The image size does not affect production time. Now, you know with embroidery, if you're going to do a full front with 300,000 stitches, it's going to take just a few minutes longer than a 5,000 stitch left chest design. Okay? So large area designs become economical to produce. See, that's the, thing, the point I was trying to make, really, is you go into sublimation, you can do bigger full color you know, imprints that you really can't do economically with embroidery, so it helps you to kind of fill in a gap there. And there's no limit to the number of colors that can be printed. Well, technically, there's always a limit. But the reality is we're not limited to 15 needles, thus 15 colors. We you know, can do millions of colors for the most part. And, and this is one of the things that really attracted me to sublimation. It works on many other items beyond apparel products. So I can expand that region you know, of sales. And it's quick and set up, ideal for short runs. I mean, people want onesies and twosies. We can do that. But, you know, like everything else, you should be aware of it, sublimation, first of all, only works on polyester and polymer products. Now, don't let that scare you, because as soon as you hear polyester, if you're like me, you're like, okay, that's it, not interested, nobody wants polyester shirts, which is not true. 
Um, but I'm going to tell you more about that here in just a minute. So don't let that feel like it's a limitation. White is the best product color. There is no white ink available for sublimation. I'll explain why. And then finally, the product must be able to handle 400 degrees during production. So I know people ask, can you do nylon? Because nylon isn't that a form of polyester, sort of. But nylon tends to melt below 400 degrees. So usually you can't sublimate it very well. Just thought we'd throw that in there. Yes? When you said white is the best product color, that you meant that the base material would be the best material. Yes. White is the best material. Yes. Okay. And a lot of people find that as a limiting factor. And uh, certainly in apparel, that's a challenge. We're going to discuss that here in just a minute. But pretty much everything else we do with sublimation, all the products you buy that are sublimatable, made for sublimation, and there's about a thousand different products out there in the marketplace, they, uh, they all have a white surface to begin with. So as you'll learn, white is the best color to print regardless of the method that we're using. So now look at this picture here and start to imagine all the different things you can do. You can probably already do the embroidery, okay? But now if you add sublimation, you can at least add in these items down here. Now this over here is screen printing, but the point being is if you had embroidery and sublimation, you could do everything on this picture here except the top right one, okay, because that one was screen printing. But right now, you probably all you can do is the one back here that's embroidered. So this just shows you how when we combine the worlds together, how we can get the best of both worlds and broaden that reach in everything we do. So how does sublimation work? Okay, as Colleen said to you, you know, that's a big strange kind of word. And people say this to me all the time, what the heck is that? You know? Uh, well, let me tell you what it is. Sublimation is a digital printing process. And it works just like transfers do in the fact that we print onto transfer paper, use a heat press, and then the image leaves the transfer paper and goes on to whatever it is that we're decorating. But chemically, it's uniquely different from anything else. It's actually a molecular process. Big words, okay? Because of the fact this only works with polyester, and there's a reason, because of the molecular nature of the beast, okay? Um, first of all, sublimation is really a dye. It's not ink, but we call it ink, and that's okay because that's just easier. But there is a huge difference between dye, dyes and ink. For example, when Madeira makes thread, they dye the thread. So if you take some of Madeira's thread and you cut it with your scissors, it's not white on the inside of the thread. It's the same color all the way through because it's been dyed, and when you dye things, you recolor the fibers. On the other hand, a lot of printing is actually just adding color to the surface of the item. For example, if you screen printed thread, which you're not really going to, but let's just say that Madeira figured a way to screen print their thread. When they cut it with scissors, the inside of that thread would probably be the original color. And say you took a, a spool of white thread and you wanted to print that thread such to make it into red thread, I guarantee you the inside of the thread would still be white, okay? Because printing is typically on the surface. It's recoloring the surface. Dyeing is recoloring the fibers pretty much from the inside out. So it's a very unique process. Okay, so sublimation is truly a dye. And here's what happens. When we apply heat, approximately 400 degrees Fahrenheit, to sublimation dyes that have been put on that transfer paper, the dye turns into a gas. It doesn't liquefy. It turns into a gas. Second thing that happens is the polymer fibers of whatever we're decorating, they open up. Think of it like a clamshell. Okay? The clamshell opens, the gas goes inside, and then when we remove the heat and take the item off the heat press, the clamshell closes back up and permanently contains that dye in the inside of the fiber. So we've recolored the fiber kind of like from the inside out. Okay? Now, that is unique. Because now what we have is something that doesn't fade, crack, or peel in the case of clothing when washed. So we can wash something that's apparel over and over again, and it's never going to fade, crack, or peel. Screen printing is going to crack over time. Okay? Some transfers using pigment-based inks, not using this type of process, uh, and also some DTG even will start to fade, crack, and peel over time, but not sublimation. Now, I will tell you sublimation is not UV resistant. So if I put it on a signage product and put it out in the sunlight, you know, you probably get about two years out of it before you feel the need to replace it. And there's nothing wrong with that because we call that recurring income. 
as long as you tell that customer, you know, up front, hey, these license plates for the police department are probably going to last you about two years after you get new ones. Okay. Everything fades. So, you know, what the heck. But at the end of the day, sublimation is really unique. When I put it onto a hard item, and you're thinking, wait a minute, you said polyester. Okay. Actually, I said polymer. Polymers are used in plastics, we'll say that, and other things. So, for example, let's say that I do a, a metal license plate. Well, I have to use one that has some type of polymer coating applied to it already, such that the sublimation will permanently bond to the polymer fibers. Okay, but that's okay. There's plenty of those out there. Um, so the reality is that we are decorating a lot of things that are more than just pure plastic, pure polymer, pure polyester. They have some type of coating that allows us to do it. And that's what gives us the wide range of all the different products that we want to be able to do. So that's huge. Are they are they advertised that way, Jim? Yeah. I mean, do you, are they advertised that they are suitable for sublimation? Yes. Or that they have polymer based? Yes. And and that is the question you you make sure you ask too. But when you look at the different companies that produce sublimation materials um, and products, they you know they'll they'll you, you real you start to learn that you know who to go shopping with, who has the blanks and that were made for sublimation. Okay, okay. Uh, so that becomes clear. Here's the other neat thing. When I put it on a hard surface, if I try to scratch it with my fingernail, it won't scratch because it's down inside the surface instead of on top. So that becomes a, it's very resilient to be able to withstand, you know, damage that way. Okay, as I said, it's quick and easy. Set it up on the screen, print it out, use the heat press to apply it. Okay, and the chances are you all have a computer. A lot of you already have a heat press, so your only investment might just simply be the printer and the inks and the paper. A couple other things. You go ahead, Colleen. No dryer. No, no dryer. No, no dryer. No, no conveyor dryer. Okay, so when it Don't comes off that. of the heat press, it's, it's ready to go. Yeah, it's done. You know, even with direct garment printing, you still use a heat press because you have to mm -hmm. cure the inks. Here, we're applying the inks with the heat press per se. Um, one of the neat things about sublimation, I mentioned briefly you can do photographs, but you can do photographs to such a high resolution that photographers are actually using sublimation to create wedding portraits. Okay, That's how good it is, provided you've got a good image to begin with. And you may be saying, I'm an embroiderer. What do I care about photography? Well, let me tell you what, diversification. There's a lot of photographers out there who are looking to do more than take a picture. They actually want to sell products, photo gifts, portraits and whatnot, rather than giving the picture to the customer for the customer to go somewhere else. and But they're not decorators. So you know what? You might team up with a photographer and say, listen, we can produce products using your images and we can both make money on it. Something to think about. Not to mention the fact you create your own thing. So if somebody brings you the picture, you can create photo gifts all day long and reproduce it, provided you got a good image to begin with. Hard goods. Probably 90% of sublimation is the hard goods, okay? Uh, the license plates, the you know the signage, the plaques, the, um, you know coasters, awards, mugs, all these types of things, and soft goods too. Um, flip flops is one of my favorites. There's flip flops available to sublimate it. You know mouse pads, uh, laptop sleeves, uh, drink huggers, koozies, whatever you want to call them. I mean, there's lots of different neat things out there that can be done, and we really should just say here non-apparel products. Lots and lots of things that we can do. But when it comes to apparel, polyester is the key. Now, some of you have already encountered that. You already know how popular poly performance is. You already know what it is. Some of you may not have. Okay. So just real briefly, poly performance products are polyester-based apparel products that have a moisture wicking capability. That's the performance aspect. And uh, we can all thank Under Armour for making that such a popular item in the retail world. And moisture wicking means it pulls moisture away from your skin, so in the summer it's warmer, uh, excuse me, cooler. cooler, we don't want it warmer, oops, uh, and in the winter it's warmer. So it becomes an all-season type of apparel. Um, you probably know from embroidery that some, most, poly performance products are kind of silky, so they're a little hard to hoop. And stretchy. They're a little challenging. Yeah, they're yeah. a little challenging for most embroiderers. Right? Definitely a little bit challenging, um, yeah. but for sublimation, because most of these are you know 100% polyester products, they're not challenging 
all that much. Uh, in fact, they're quite simple to do. Um, and by the way, I'm going to reference you a little bit as we go through on the Sawgrass website, sawgrassinc.com. If you go there and click on Education and Events, you can see that we have a whole collection of videos there, including one on how to sublimate polyperformance apparel. So lots of free videos there to show you exactly how to work with some of the different products. Um, plus, I did a full-blown webinar on nothing but sublimation of polyperformance products. So we got a lot of good resources to really take you through you know, the details of how to get it done. Okay. You know, and a left chest is still very doable. You know, a small left chest design yep. is still very doable on the performance wear. But trying to do anything larger than that, like you're showing here, yeah. is definitely even a bigger, a bigger challenge. So yeah, and you know, but it, it l lends itself to a combination because you may do, say, a left chest embroidery on the front and then a full print on the back. On the back, right. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see in this particular one, if you look close on this larger shirt, that's actually photography that's combined with the logo as well. So there's a lot going on on that particular shirt. Now, one of the things to keep in mind, if you don't already know it, and you probably do, poly performance products do cost more. You know, a blank poly performance T-shirt, for example, is about five bucks. And you got to be careful because the perception of most people of a T-shirt is that it's a very low cost item, and it's it's not. So you have to be careful when you market that you don't use the word T-shirt. I would never use the word T-shirt if I can avoid it when talking about poly performance apparel because I don't want to set the bar too low. If somebody is buying a poly performance tee, yeah, I had to go use it, didn't I? Um, but the point being is, you know, there are, a lot of these are really heavy duty, well made, meaning that they stand up to washings for an extensive period of time. Um, but keep in mind the benefits. It doesn't fade when washed if we sublimated it. Okay? It's moisture wicking capability. Make sure, by the way, all polyester is not moisture wicking. Okay? Only performance products that are identified as performance products truly have any type of moisture wicking. So don't ever confuse poly and poly performance. But at the end of the day, for you to sell it, you want to focus on longevity, meaning that the image doesn't fade, doesn't crack, doesn't peel. We can wash as much as we want. Shirt doesn't fall apart. Uh, if it has performance characteristics, it's comfortable to wear year-round. It's a better buy. Sure, it costs more, but it's a better buy. And even poly performance, well, not poly performance, poly headwear. Um, I will tell you that it's tricky to put logos onto some hats with sublimation. The ones that work best are the five-panel trucker-style caps uh, using a cap press, but it can be done, okay? And I hate those things. When people say, Jimmy, of all your years in embroidery, what do you hate the most? I said, trucker's hats. The first time and now that they're back, I hate them just as bad, especially the foam front ones because the embroidery threads sink into it, and it's hard to get a good embroidery, and they're so blasted cheap. Nobody wants to pay anything for them anyway. But what the heck, you can always... It's nice to know you, you don't have an opinion about that. <laughs> no, not at all. Oh. Give me a six-panel, low-profile, unconstructed cap any day of the week, and I'm happy. Yeah. For embroidering, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so what does it cost? What does it cost to get into sublimation? Um, first of all, it's not that expensive, as I said. You know, depends on the pieces you need. You're going to have to have a computer with some graphic software, Corel Draw, Photoshop, those kind of things. You do not buy digitizing software. In other words, you don't buy a sublimation graphic program. You just buy you use your standard graphics, which you probably already have. Um, heat press, and if you already have the heat press, you just took out the biggest expense of all. And then finally, you know, a suitable printer that you know supports sublimation inks. And uh, in case of Madeira, um, you deal with the Rico printers. Which are great printers. That's correct. So, you know, on the on the low end of the scale, you know, if you're only getting a printer equipped with inks and paper, you're probably talking around five hundred dollars or so, somewhere in that ballpark figure, without quoting any prices for anybody. Okay. But if you throw in a heat press, you might add another twelve hundred to it because you really got to have a good quality heat press. Let me tell you something: heat presses control the process. So if you have a cheap heat press you may get inferior sublimation. Keep that in mind. The heat press is an important part because I know there's a lot of $300 units on eBay that may or may not do a very good job for you. You're better off to invest in a good quality heat press. It's going to last you forever anyway. It makes a huge difference. And, 
And and we we've gone with the night presses. Yes, which, the press. Uh, you know, according to the industry reputation, um, they are you know among the best American made. Um, anyway, they and the the mug press runs around seven hundred. And you're right, it's eleven hundred at the top of the line. Oh well, you're, we're looking at probably fifteen hundred tops. Right. For a good heat press. Right. Yep. With, so. So. That's why I throw that range right, out there. Right, and that's there. got multi-purpose it's, too. Yeah. Yep, totally depends on what pieces you need. But the point I'm making here is, you know, I'm spending ten thousand. You know, I'm spending twenty-five thousand. You're spending a relatively low amount of money to be able to get into something that just tremendously broadens your, you know, potential for sales. What does it cost? Sublimation imaging costs. I mean, this is just a test one we used. Um, to compare some of the different printers and, and things that we support. Uh, this particular image from Great Dane Graphics, I always give him credit since he provides our, you know, uh, graphics and artwork for me to use in different presentations. But we printed that as an 8-inch by 10-inch, uh, and this was actually on a Ricoh 7000 printer, which it came out to about $0.64 cents in cost, including paper and ink, and printed in under 30 seconds. A Rico 3300, I think the cost is around 72 cents, so it's fairly close. The point being is, it's not, you know, it's less than a dollar to do pretty much a full front on something. Okay, not a lot of cost there. That's really what we're trying to say. Every image is going to be a little different, but what the heck? That gives you just a representation. Now, it's always worthy to know there are production variables. I mean, sometimes we try to make it sound like you know, you close your eyes and you push a button and it's done. Uh, but the reality I was telling you about heat presses. And all the magic of sublimation happens with a heat press. You know, our standard production setting is one minute at 400 degrees and 40 psi of pressure, medium pressure, with the heat press. These are settings you have to adjust. And you know what? If you vary them, you can vary the quality of the image. And it's okay because different products, we sometimes do vary them. Okay? It's just like with embroidery. You have to vary density and underlay, thread tension, backing, needle types, depending on what you're dealing with. And, you know, the same as with sublimation, uh, we may actually change it. For example, when we're usually doing poly performance apparel, we probably go more on the line of about 45 seconds instead of one minute at around 380 degrees with an almost zero pressure. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, if I'm doing a mug, in a mug press, I'm probably going to go three to five minutes and possibly a little higher, you know. So, yeah, there are some things there, but the thing for you to understand is that we have variables in the process, just like there's variables with the embroidery, which you may have to tweak it. I mean, you already know, embroidery machine, you're tweaking thread tension. I mean, that's just a normal part of embroidery. So you may be doing a little tweaking here, too. Uh, the key thing is to write down your tweakings so you can develop recipes, okay. So it's not all that hard to learn, but you know, definitely something's going on. But just going back to the heat press real quick, the one thing about buying a good quality heat press is you want to make sure the heat is consistent throughout the platen. Because if you have inconsistent heat, you'll have inconsistent molecular action during the sublimation process, which means inconsistent quality of imaging. And if you're tempted to go out and buy that dirt cheap giveaway heat press, I encourage you just to say, listen, I've got to invest in the right thing, okay? If you don't invest in the right thing, you're going to be sorry later. Buy a good quality heat press, okay? You want to be able to control it, manage it, and make the production process work for you. So let's talk about graphics management for a minute because, you know, certainly with embroidery, we go through digitizing, you know? But when we start talking about printing, it's a totally, totally different world because, we are recreating artwork, photos, and whatever by actually mixing the colors. It's kind of interesting. You know, with embroidery, you pick a cone of thread and you put it on the machine. But in the case of any type of digital printing, you have different color cartridges of ink at the printer, and you're using commands to tell it to blend different variations of those colors to create the final color you want. So you're actually mixing paint, as I like to say. You're also dealing with items that are uh, different shapes and sizes. Think about a JPEG. You're working with a JPEG. It's always a rectangle. Okay, well, how do I deal with this plaque here? What about this plaque over here? Those have got some weird shapes. 
How do I manage that? How am I going to get my artwork into that shape? That sounds kind of difficult, you know. Well, it's not as bad as it sounds. Uh, I got a simple representation here. Typical artwork, square. Okay, this is a coaster, and this is a hard polyfiber coaster. And the company that makes this is called Unisub, U-N-I-S-U-B. And if you go to the Unisub website, they have a vector, and they have a bitmap version, but they have, in this case, a vector graphic of that actual uh, coaster, which is basically your template is what I'm getting at. They have templates, and they have them available in CorelDRAW format, which can be a vector. They also have them available in Photoshop format. So I go to their website, I download that template in, and if I'm using CorelDRAW, I can merge the artwork over that template and use a function called Power Clip. And when I click on Power Clip, it'll actually automatically crop it and shape it to fit that template. Voila. I now have my artwork in the shape that I need to be able to do that particular coaster. If you're using Photoshop, you use layers. Not sure how to use either one of these? Go to the Sawgrass website, sawgrassinc.com, and look under Education Events. Click on How-To Videos. You'll see a video that shows you how to do this with PowerClip and how to do it with Photoshop. So the resources are there, and it's actually pretty easy. Okay, it's just a little challenging at first. That they, you know, the first time you got to go through that. The other thing to keep in mind is when we're printing on shirts, the problem is we're dealing typically with artwork that's in a rectangular format. So you know what? When we put a picture on a shirt, it looks boring if we're not careful. We get that. Okay, and uh, really the best way to describe that is you get a photo on a shirt and it looks like a photo on a shirt. So consider adding a border or something. You got to break that up. I cannot stand a box on a shirt. Okay, so it still looks like a box, but at least it has a border. Okay, it looks different. Um, here's a different border, but you can see I'm trying to make it look more custom. Okay, I'm trying not to have that restrictive shape. And um, so you got to be creative there. Another way to do that, and the best way to do it, is using tools like in uh, your graphics program to remove the background. Look at that. That looks pretty good. Okay. And what I did was I cleaned up all that extra background, so I got away from that rectangular look, and now I got something that looks more custom, like it belongs there. So that's another one of your challenges because with embroidery, you're not. You may be using a JPEG image, but you're not boxed into that shape when you digitize something or set it up. You know, you have free-flowing boundaries. But with graphics, you don't tend to have free-flowing boundaries, so you have to figure a way to make it look that way. And that's exactly what I did here. Color management, just another part of graphics management, really. And that is the challenge of what you see is not always what you get. Now, I learned this with embroidery first time because I remember when they started adding thread charts into my digitizing software. It's pretty cool. I could uh, install the Madeira thread charts into my software, and I could choose the actual threads I wanted to use to show up on the screen in the design. But I always noticed that when I printed it out or what I saw on the screen never quite matched the actual thread, so I really always depended on pulling the thread off the shelf and looking at it or taking my handy-dandy real thread card, the physical one, you know, from Madeira and looking at it to make sure that I was getting the right color. So this becomes really challenging to printers because when we go to print something, let me tell you, if you take a piece of artwork right now and you go print it out on four different printers, it's going to look different on every printer. Hate to tell you, okay? And I mean, I got, let's see, one, two, three HP desktop printers right here in my office for just doing paper graphics. And I guarantee you it'll print a little different on every single one of them because that's the way it's managing the ink. There's a lot of variables going on. So, of course, this causes a headache because what you see is not always what you get. We know that, too, when it comes to sublimation. Okay, And I struggled with this a little bit in the beginning, I'll tell you, because um, it was a little bit frustrating because what's happening here is two basic things. Number one, what you see on the computer monitor is in a RGB mode. Okay, That's how it's generating color through the RGB mode. Uh, whereas the printers are typically in a CMYK. So we got two different languages going on. So we got to convert the color from what's on the screen to what's on the printer. And in the case of sublimation, what comes out of the printer is not the final color. When you actually print sublimation transfer paper out, the colors on there don't really come to life until you put it under the heat press. Another little variance, okay? Uh, the second thing is something called color gamut. And I wasn't sure I was even going to get, introduce you to that word. But the reality is the range of colors that a printer can print is smaller 
than a computer monitor can show. So you got to be careful that when you're using a random collection of colors on a computer monitor that they can even be reproduced by your printer. For example, if you're using CorelDRAW and you're using the palettes of color or color charts, if you want to call it that, that come with it, there's no guarantee that your printer can actually reproduce the same colors that you're seeing on the screen anyway. So there's a bit of a limiting factor here. So what you want to do is understand that what comes out of the printer is always right. Sounds wrong, but it's always right. Um, it's the input color that's wrong. So if you see the wrong color coming out of the printer, it's not the printer's fault. It's because what you chose on the screen wasn't really the right color for the output. It was just the color for the input. Confused yet? Anyway, I think I can show this to you a little better. Um, what we recommend that people do is stick with one basic palette of colors. Now here I have a, a reduced size palette here. And that way if you actually take that palette of color and you go print it out with your sublimation printer and then take that as a transfer and apply it to a substrate, any kind of substrate, uh, you know, a lot of times we recommend there's uh, some actually a large aluminum panels you can buy that have a white coating on them, ideal for sublimation. Print it out on there, then sublimate it using the heat press. Now you have a color chart you can hold in front of your face and you know exactly what the color looks like when it's output. So now if I have this same color palette standing in front of me just like you see here and I install an electronic version of this same color palette into my graphic software, and yes, I'll show you how you can do that, um, and only use that chart electronically, then I can look at my printout. Think of this as a thread card if you want. And I say, listen, see that blue right there? It's got a name underneath. It actually has a recipe, but it's got a name. So let's say that's Jimmy Blue. So if I look at that blue in front of my face on that piece of metal that I printed out on or whatever I printed out on. Maybe I printed it on a shirt. Maybe I printed it on a license plate. Whatever. I'm holding it up and I'm actually looking at the physical color face to face and I say if I choose that blue it's going to print that color blue. Now I go to the computer and I pull up this same color chart on the computer and I choose that blue. It may not look the same on the screen. It doesn't matter because I know that when I choose it that's what I get out. And so you are working sometimes in that world again on the screen where the colors aren't quite what you want but they're going to be right when you come on the output because you chose your color based on the output. Just like pulling a cone of thread off the shelf and looking at it and then selecting it off an electronic chart in your digitizing program. may not look right on screen, but you know it's going to be right when it sews because you know what that final color looks like. Okay, if you're purchasing the Sublijet um, sublimation system from Madeira, one of the things that you'll find once you buy it is you can download a free um, software driver called Power Driver that you will install to be able to process colors the right way. And it includes in it what's called the Color Share Palette. And the Color Share Palette, and it's bigger than you see right there, but it's a it's a nice large palette of colors that have been pre-engineered to work ideally with sublimation. And then you can actually upload that palette into Corel Draw, Photoshop, and Illustrator. Okay, and there's videos of how to do that on our website, uh, so it's easy to do so that you're always using a controlled collection of colors that we know the printer is capable of reproducing. See, that's an important aspect. We know the color, the printer can do it. When you're using the ones that are built in on something like CorelDRAW and you see this massive amount of colors here in this graphic, there's no guarantee we can actually reproduce that exact shade with that printer due to the range of color limitation by any given printer. Hopefully I'm not making that too um, too difficult. Bottom line is there is a way to take care of that challenge. That's all we're saying. Okay. Um, and we actually have some videos on color management you know, available on the Sawgrass website too, to help you out. Okay. Moving on, we're almost at the top of the hour here, but just real quickly, you know, one of the things you hear about sublimation is that it only works on white, and that's not true. It does work on other colors, but white is the best color. Uh, when we print on colored shirts, for example, and, you know, unfortunately people do want colored shirts. I don't know why they can't stick with white, but sometimes they want more. We can do light colored shirts with sublimation, but as the, dark, the, the color of the garment gets darker, the sublimation tends to be less visible and it tends to be impacted by the background color as well. 
So when you go to something like red, black works great on red, but I wouldn't try to put pink or orange on red with sublimation. Probably not going to work so well. So light colors definitely are better than dark colors for sublimation, with white being the best color of all. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there is no white ink for sublimation. And this is, again, most of you are new to printing. Keep in mind that when we set up colors to be printed, they are actually created at the printer. Okay? They're mixed together using a recipe. And most printers have four colors, basic colors of ink, uh, CMYK, okay? cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. K is black. So between those colors, we can create pretty much any color we want mixing them together within reason except one, white. You can't mix any group of colors to create white. You know, in fact, normally when fabric thread is made for uh, sewing fabric to sew white shirts, they bleach the thread. That's how they get it white. So white ink is, has to be engineered. Um, and not many processes offer an engineered white ink because it's kind of difficult to use. So the standard thing is your graphics program assumes that your four color printer can't do white. So it leaves areas of white in a design open, like the neck on the eagle. Okay. That looks good because it's on a white shirt. That's actually open. That's the shirt color, you know, substituting for not having white ink. We put on a yellow shirt. Look what happens. Yellow okay. Eagle. Yeah. And you know what else happens is the background yellow starts to impact the color of the inks that are on there. So, you know, we don't have any, you know, the color background affects multiple things is what I'm saying. So if you have a design that doesn't need white color in there, you can put in on light colors without any problem. But if you actually need to have white in there, it's not going to work. Okay. So that becomes a bit of a challenge. Now, the way real quickly that screen printers do this, just to educate a little bit, for those who don't know, in the world of screen printing, the way that they handle darks is they do use an engineered white ink. And they put that down as a layer all by itself right off the bat. And, you know, screen printing ink looks kind of like mud. Um, but anyway, they put it on there, mud or pudding. And then they put the rest of the layers on top. And before they do, they hit it with heat. They use a flash cure system that cures that white ink enough so that they can put the rest of the design on top in layers. I didn't do it in layers. but Okay, so two things happen. Number one, they create a white base so that the colors of this image pop and look good. Because if you put that directly on black without the white underneath it, the, images might, the image itself might suffer. Okay. The second thing is all the rest of the areas that are white in this football were left open so that that background color is creating the white and then it just shows through in all those open areas. That's the way they do it with screen printing. The red garment system, some have it, some don't. They have to force the white ink through an inkjet head, so that means they need you know, a very, very <coughs> low viscosity, thin type of ink to be able to get it through. And that's challenging in and of itself. Oops, hit the wrong button. I'm flailing around with my mouse. Okay, so um, in the world of DTG, they had to design an ink that, first of all, goes through the head. Second of all, dries almost instantly when it comes in contact with air, but not too quick. And third, most systems use a catalyst to activate the quick drying capability of the ink. So most systems, you actually have to spray the garment with some type of pretreatment initially, and it's a chemical catalyst so that when the white ink hits the garment, interacts with the pretreatment, it hardens or dries, semi-dries, enough that we can put colored ink on top. Okay? The drawback, and you may hear this with DTG, is if you don't properly maintain that white ink in the heads, it can harden in the heads and it'll destroy the heads and cost you a bunch of money. Okay. In the world of sublimation, we don't have white ink. And we can't put down a base layer of white because sublimation is designed to bond with the fibers in the actual garment or the hard surface item or whatever. So if you put down a layer of white ink first, it would block the sublimation from getting into the polymer fibers anyway. Therefore, white ink is just not really going to physically work for sublimation. Now, one thing you may see, just so I'll make sure I don't get told that I'm a liar later, uh, you may see um, poly performance shirts that have been sublimated that look like they used white ink. For example, the one here on the left, Max Gear, you see all the white. And you say, well, how did they do that? You said they couldn't do that. I said, well, here's what they did. This is something that's called wide format or all over printing. 
The shirt started its life being white. As you can see, the bottom of the shirt's open. And a transfer was created for the front and one was created for the back. And the entire front was sublimated all in one shot, leaving open the white areas and thus the background material showing through. And then we did one for the back as well. In the case of a t-shirt, because it has pretty much no collar, you can actually do that on the finished garment. One transfer on the front, one transfer on the back. In the case of a shirt like this that has a collar, it was most likely done in a cut and sew process as the shirt was being manufactured. But that's how we were able to do white ink on a shirt without white ink, because we still didn't use white ink. We just let the areas open. But the reality is this, okay? Lest you think this is a huge limitation, it's only a limitation with apparel. Because when we're doing hard items or non-apparel items, they do come with a white surface, every single one of them. That's the only color pretty much. And we normally are making the graphic to be what we call full bleed, from edge to edge. So if you see right here, let's call that a mouse pad. You see a white rectangle. Um, and then I'm going to apply a design to it. There's white in it, but that was left open. And the black background, I didn't start with a black mouse pad. I started with a white one. And I recolored the entire thing at the same time. So the only time where lack of a white ink is any issue at all is truly with apparel. And then those need to be pressed as well. So they go through a heat press system as well? Yes. Okay. So hard or soft goods always need to be pressed. By the way, if you ever wanted to, to vaporize do... the ink. Right. The right. If you're ever doing wide format printing on apparel, you have to have a wide format printer and a wide format heat press. So you're actually talking a sizable investment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So bottom line, we're really not going to go into pricing sublimation. I'm just putting this here because I want to hit you on one thing, and then we're going to pretty much wrap up for the day. Um, one of the things I learned a long time ago about pricing is when you look at pricing your embroidery, your screen printing, your sublimation, whatever, you have to understand what really goes into the job. And, you know, I ran into people who were trying to add up how much thread and bobbin and backing they used on a job to figure out what it cost. And you couldn't be further from the truth. And anybody that's ever taken any of my pricing webinars knows this because I really illustrate what all the true costs are. In fact, materials cost is usually the is 10% probably of what the overall production cost is. You know, and I hear the same thing with ink because, you know, what happens is people look in their, you know, their accounting and they say, well, look, I just spent, you know, $600 in ink or something this month. And they're like, how can I cut that cost? Wouldn't it be nice to get half price ink? I tried that once with thread. Sorry, Colleen. Um, but I did. I mean, I was buying great thread. Okay. And let's see who that might have come from. Uh, 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 Madeira? Okay. Ah. And, and now don't hate me when I tell you this story. Okay. So. I was doing a lot of production with embroidery. I'm spending about $1,000 a month um, in thread. And I'm always looking at that number in my, you know, my books and saying, how can I reduce that number? And I was looking at it very short-sighted because you know, you know, if I could get my thread for half price, look how much money I would save. Well, along came a guy from a new kid on the block knocking on the door. And essentially, he says, you know, I can get you cones of thread for probably $3 less per month. Of course, it's just as good. You know how that goes, right? So I fell prey to that, decided to experiment. You know, I'm a good business person. Let's see what, what he's talking about. And you know what? I immediately reduced my thread cost by probably close to 600 I mean, about $400 a month. I dropped it down to probably about 600 a month instead of 1000 Okay? Mm -hmm. And I was patting myself on the back right up to the point that it seemed like it was taking longer to get jobs done. And I was going out on the floor and saying, well, you know, you should have had this done by now. What's the problem? Well, we, we just have more thread breaks than we used to. Huh? Well, we're, we're having a lot more thread breaks. What do you mean? Well, you switch threads, and these threads seem to give us more thread breaks. So we did an analysis. Make a long story short, we were probably losing about, uh, we were saving about $400 a month in thread, but we were losing about $600 worth of production easily. Because the machines were constantly, you know, you're talking about multi-end machine. Boop, stop, fix thread break. And then it stop, fix thread break. That adds up, you know. And when you start doing the numbers of how much a thread break can cost, oh, my gosh, you know. And so that was short-sighted. By going back to the better quality thread, 
we had less thread breaks and we had more production run. It was actually more efficient. So I learned that you got to look past what darn stuff costs. What are you getting in return? That's the same thing with ink. I was the same way, always looking at, gee, I wish we could get this cheaper. So, you know, I had somebody even saying that to me once. I said, listen, you just spent 60 cents to do a full color image on the front of a shirt. Well, let's say a dollar for easy math. So if you got your thread for half price, it's 50 cents instead of a dollar. Is that going to make or break you? And what if your quality went down? You know, what if it's substandard? What did you get for that? So at the end of the day, what I want you to understand is don't sit there and look and say, well, Jimmy said it was about 64 cents to do this image because the reality is your production costs are higher than that. And the best way to find out is, again, go to the Sawgrass website, click on Education Events, go down to where you see Webcast Archives, uh, and then click on Login to Watch Videos. First time in, you got to register. It's easy. It's free. And then once you're in there, go to my pricing webinar and watch it online or download it to your computer. And the spreadsheet that goes with it works wonders. Okay, it'll really help you understand about pricing of sublimation. You know, the thing is, it doesn't cost you a lot to do, but you have the area for a lot of margins. You know, increases, and that's what you really want at the end of the day. You know, you can look at the 64 cents in 30 seconds. That's great. That's just to give you a representation. You need to really understand everything that goes into it so that you can price your products the right way. Same with embroidery. It's not limited to that. Okay, so finally, we went a little long here, but go ahead, Colleen. Okay, I just wanted to interject, too, what you were saying about the cost of a thread break uh, is very important, as, and sometimes price isn't, uh, you shouldn't let that, you know, determine what you use. Right. On our website, on the Madeira Fund, we do give you some information about the cost of a thread break if you have a single head or, you know, depending on how many heads you're running to help people understand that you get what you pay for. Absolutely. So they can go to our Madeira website the same way they can go to, to, to see what, uh, you know, what it costs them every time the machine stops. I had a very wise embroiderer who still to this day runs a very large production shop down in Arizona, you probably know who I'm talking about, and, and he said, listen, he said, at the end of the day, you invest in, he doesn't do digitizing, he said, invest in a reliable digitizer that is good, can be trusted, can be depended on, and who helps and gives you advice, whatever. He said, invest in a good digitizer, invest in good thread. He said, you know what, you get those two things taken care of, your machines are going to run great, well, invest in good equipment too, but, you know, after you buy the equipment, those are key things to keep the business running and growing the right way. But, as for sublimation, as you can see, sublimation, easy way to expand the mar you know, your markets. Um, and I'll tell you, I do a lot of webinars uh, and seminars at shows, seminars at shows, and, and I meet a lot of you and, and a lot of other embroiderers. And i got to tell you, I mean, the interest for embroiderers is huge. Um, every sublimation workshop that I do is, it seems like 75% of the people in there are embroiderers because they're looking for a low-cost way to expand what they do. And obviously, when you look on the screen here, Look at all these different things you can suddenly do with sublimation that you can't do right now. Something to think about. So, real quick, I mentioned it several times, but if you go to sawgrassinc.com, you don't have to remember those whole domain names. You just go to sawgrassinc.com, click on education and events. There you'll find our how-to videos, our webcast videos. You'll find access to all kinds of information on you know growing your business, making money, marketing fundraisers. I mean, there's tons of things that we've done in our educational program that we make it available to you because, you know, our goal is to help you be successful, to help you launch your sublimation business the right way. Um, you know, Madeira is there to help you get you started, and we're here to kind of help, you know, educate you what you need to know and keep you moving along, and, and that's what we're all about. So if you visit the education events page, there's just a small taste of, you know, all the different things you can see when you get there. I encourage you to go and download the Sublimation 101 guide, free ebook. You can download. Uh, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, and, um, you know, you can read. We have references to magazine articles all the time. So you can go see what's being out printed out there just to keep that learning process going. You know, that's what it's all about there. Uh, we also encourage you to join our, you know, our blog, How to Sublimate, at howtosublimate.com. Can't forget that one. Uh, plenty of good information there uh, on a routine daily basis. Uh, Twitter, I know you used to think Twitter was kind of silly, but you know what? Twitter's got a lot of good stuff. I mean, there's a lot of good people publishing really good, useful things online, and then they'll, you know, they'll make a tweet about it, which has a link right back to it. So, I mean, it's worthwhile being there, kind of keeping up the latest news. And if you're into Facebook, 
we do all kinds of things with the Facebook people on our website uh, or Facebook site. You know, for example, later this week, I'm, um, we threw out to our Facebook fans for the Sawgrass site, hey, here's three topics for a webinar. Which one do you want to hear? You know, I mean, we throw it out to people here. Vote on which topic you're most interested in. The vote's already in. And uh, so if you're on Facebook, you would know what that topic's going to be. So a lot of good information there. As well, the Madeira site, which I didn't have a picture of. I apologize. But at MadeiraUSA.com, a lot of good resources there. I mean, Madeira, I've always had the greatest respect for Madeira. I have worked with Madeira for many years because, you know what, they're very education-oriented as well. And people like Colleen and her staff, have an abundant knowledge of embroidery and the processes and the products. You know, they can help you solve issues. And uh, you always want to keep that in mind when looking at your suppliers. So, now we, go we ahead. Will, we will be, I was just going to say, we will be sending out a thank you to all of you people who registered uh, for the seminar, uh, the webinar, excuse me. Uh, along uh, and in that will be uh, a copy of this webinar that you've just listened to so that if you've missed something or Jimmy was talking too fast um, you'll or coughing. be able to or coughing <laughs> he'll be you'll be able to uh, review that again uh, so I just did want to mention that um, you will be getting that uh, probably tomorrow uh, I thank you for uh, visiting with us uh, and eating lunch with us, I hope. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to start taking questions here. We already got some there, and um, I have one that I'm going to go ahead and tackle. And this one comes from an individual who says, well, what are the advantages for us for sublimation? We're already doing embroidery, DTG printing, and vinyl T-shirts. Um, what are the advantages? Well, one of the advantages is pretty much everything you listed there is apparel. And you can get out of apparel if you get into sublimation and start providing these other things. You know, you know, promotional products. You can't do every promotional products out there, but there's a lot of promotional items you can do. And that becomes one of the big things is being able to do the the non-apparel products that your embroidery machine's not going to do, and your DTG may not be able to handle. Uh, you know, those types of things. You're also going to find that the quality of sublimation on a poly performance tee is better than the quality of DTG on the same thing because most DTG inks are actually cotton-based inks and they don't bond with the poly. They just try to stick to the surface and they probably don't stick that well. They do have a tendency to fade when you wash and their color vibrancy isn't there. Well, you may not be doing a lot of poly, poly performance. You really don't care, but definitely... If you are having to do poly performance, and it's going to keep expanding because now that poly performance products are being made that look and feel like cotton, but they're really breathable um, poly, that's just going to only increase. But really, if you're doing a lot of different apparel decoration, sublimation is going to benefit you by giving you the ability to do a lot of non-apparel products. What about sublimation on round items such as mugs and cups? If you're going to do uh, round items, there's two different ways to do it. One is to use a mug press, which is designed for round items. The second is something called a wrap, and it looks like a, a drink koozie that you wrap around. It actually wraps around and latches, and it will hold the transfer sheet up against the mug while you're doing it. And you put those actually in convection ovens. So you can do multiple ones. Uh, don't use your oven in the kitchen buy a basic convection oven, but now maybe you can do four, five, ten mugs all at the same time, and water bottles, for example. Uh, also, they make large wraps for like pet food bowls, like the water bowl for Fido. You can actually, it's pretty large round, you get the larger wraps and you can wrap around some of those larger things. By the way, there's also people that are selling iPhone covers that can be sublimated with custom graphics now. So it's not a round item, but um, it's a little unique, a little bit different. Um, we did not, there was a question, are you going to cover techniques on how to mix sublimation and embroidery? We did not, but if you look at a previous webinar that Colleen and I did, that's where we talked about digital applique and multimedia, and there you can see uh, information about the techniques for mixing sublimation and embroidery, as well as some other printing processes too. How many times can you wash a t-shirt that's been sublimated? You can wash it until the t-shirt falls apart and the sublimation doesn't fade. 
as long as it's truly a polyester, 100% polyester tea. If it has a blend, any type of blend in it, and you can you can sublimate blended shirts. You can do 50/50, for example. You can do 80/20s. Um, but if you sublimate a blended shirt, it will have more of a faded type of appearance. It looks kind of washed out, and it will wash. Uh, it'll fade a little bit more on the first washing, but after that, it won't anymore. But if it's 100% polyester that's been sublimated, uh, the sublimation will last longer than the shirt. Uh, please name some printers which are good for using transfer ink and some brands of transfer ink. Well, the only brand of transfer ink I deal with is Chroma Blast, uh, which is sold by Madeira, and the Rico printer is the best printer for that because you have to buy the printer that the ink is manufactured for. You know, the cartridges and cartridges typically that plug in, so it's only going to fit that printer. And there's more to it than that. It has a lot to do with the head technology. Does sublimation crack over time? Nope. Will sublimation work on cotton? Nope. <laughs> Does it? Can you bleach sublimated? Uh, uh, you need right. chroma blast ink and a separate printer uh, for uh, cotton. cotton. Absolutely. And, and Madeira right now is offering both. Yep. And you know what? You apply chroma blast ink the same way you do sublimation, same steps. You print it on a transfer paper, then put it on the heat press, then transfer paper is removed and thrown away. But it's a totally different chemical base for that particular ink. Can sublimated shirts be bleached? Yes. If gas is created during sublimation, is it safe indoors? Yes. It's non-toxic. There's a whole, you know, MSA listing, you know, on the website about, you know, the chemical content and everything, but it's safe. Is the sublimation the same as direct garment printing? Nope. I mean, sublimation is its own unique chemical process. Direct to garment printing, they apply the ink directly onto the garment. Sublimation goes through a transfer, um, but and then it requires heat to activate it. So um, that's the way it, why it works the way that it works. Uh, Colleen, when will the video be available? I mean, first of all, I have to process it and give it to you, and that'll be 24 hours before I even get it to you. Uh, but then people want to know where I, they can I find the video. The Right, the latest on Friday, and it'll come as a, a link in the thank you. Or they'll be able to go online and go to the Madeira website, and it'll be available there as well. What software do you recommend? Uh, CorelDRAW. If, you, if you're going to do logos and stuff, go with CorelDRAW. If you're going to do photography, then Photoshop's probably better. Of course, I, don't mind, I like Illustrator too, but CorelDRAW seems more popular. Where can you buy wholesale blanks? Um, you know, there's a huge listing out there. I mean, really, all you got to do is Google, you know, sublimatable blanks, and you'll start finding people that carry them. You can always email me directly, and I'll, I'll give you a few sources. Uh, is sublimation applicable to regular polyester or only performance fabric? No, it works for regular polyester. Um, one thing I should give you a warning. What we have found is there are some manufacturers of um, polyester uh, apparel who are telling people, hey, it's polyester, therefore it's sublimatable. Okay, the reality we found that some of these manufacturers, they're using um, processes in production that interfere with the sublimation. For example, some, but not all, some my antimicrobial finishes have a tendency to block the pores uh, in the polyperformance product, such that sublimation doesn't penetrate properly into the fibers. So, you know, what I would suggest is if you're looking at a uh, apparel product to sublimate, you should ask the supplier, um, A, is it sublimatable? And they'll say, oh, sure it is because it's polyester. And say, good, have you done it before? Show me a sample, and do you have instructions with recommended settings for your particular apparel product? Also, if I have issues, this is somebody I can call. So the ones who've actually gone and tested it, that's what I'm trying to get at. If they've actually gone and tested it and can show you the test results of how well their product sublimates, great. But if they've never tested it, don't assume that just because it's poly gives you a good sublimation quality. When you're doing front and back sublimation, full bleed sublimation, uh, what can you stuff inside a garment as a template? Um, I've never put a template inside. I mean, when we're doing front and back, the transfer is actually slightly larger than the shirt itself. Um, 
if you, I can actually send you and show you a transfer that was done for one. But you make the transfer that completely covers the entire front of the shirt, and you make it slightly larger all the way around than the shirt itself. So there isn't really a need for a template. Uh, now you might have been thinking inside. Sometimes people say, "Well, does it bleed through? Do I need to stuff something inside?" In the better quality T-shirts, it does not bleed through when you do front and back. Um, if you're really, really worried about that, use some blank newsprint inside. But I haven't had bleed through problems enough to make any issues. But I use better quality garments too. Uh, you stated white dye is not available, but you showed a signage plaque with dark background that had white in the design. That's because the signage plaque was manufactured with the entire surface being white. And then when the sublimation was applied, the white areas of the design were left open such that the white of the plaque is what you see, not white ink. That's standard. I mean, your, your software is doing that and you don't even know it. Uh, what about new flex caps? Caps can be tricky for sublimation. I mean, first of all, they do have to be poly. But the question is, can I get the cap on a um, cap press properly such that I can put the sublimation on there? It's trickier. It's harder than it sounds. Um, you need to experiment with that. It's the only thing I can really tell you. Um, someone says that uh, they heard that if you apply heat over 250 degrees, you break down the integrity of the Under Armour. I really couldn't tell you. I mean, most Under Armour products are dark in color, and people don't really go and necessarily sublimate them in their shops. Um, so that would be a question to Under Armour, but most of the poly performance blanks that we're working with out there can withstand the 400 degrees without any problem whatsoever. Um, let's see. Do you need the printer to be designated for sublimation only? You can use it for other things. Um, sublimation only, really, because the reality is sublimation ink costs more than regular paper ink, okay, or what we call OEM ink. And you don't want to be wasting your sublimation ink on non-sublimation items. Uh, in order to switch that printer to an OEM ink, you actually have to flush the ink. And what people don't realize is that when you first put a cartridge of ink in a completely empty printer, um, you have to charge the system. And it will easily use 50% of the entire print cartridge just charging up the system because there's a lot of tubing and reservoirs that you may not see below the surface in a given printer. So every time you switch out, if you wanted to go from sublimation back to just regular printing ink, you got to flush all that ink completely out, which means you lose it. It's wasted uh, before you install the other ink back in. Considering that the printers aren't that expensive to begin with, you're far better off to just keep that printer designated for that one purpose rather than wasting ink. And you're probably looking at a, a $200, 250 right. investment in the printer, a dedicated printer for the sublimation ink. Right. Again, the Surf's Up graphic you showed has white in the design. How did you do that without white dye? Uh, what we applied it on, the only thing we've ever applied it on in, in apparel is white shirts. Therefore, the white area is the shirt coming through. Okay. If you wanted to put that on a yellow shirt, then the white areas would be yellow. So, you know, that's that limitation. If I put it on any of the hard items, those are all white to begin with. So, you know, that's how that's done. That was kind of like where you showed the the eagle, the white eagle, right. and then you put it on a yellow shirt, and we had a yellow eagle. Is sublimation weatherproof on hard goods? Sublimation is not UV resistant. It will fade in the sunlight over time. There is not a standard rule of how much and how fast because it really depends really how much it's in the sunlight, how direct it is, et cetera, et cetera. What I have found talking to people using products that have been out in the sunlight that, you know, feedback is about two years um, in sunlight. Really, again, it depends on the intensity and where it's placed on how fast it fades. It's a gradual fading, so you certainly don't go and notice it, you know, and over time you eventually realize, well, maybe it did fade.
Is there a basic chart for time, heat, and pressure settings for various items? Yeah, there's one on the Sawgrass website, but also pay attention when you buy something from a manufacturer. A lot of times they include instructions, too, on what's ideal for their particular product. For example, using vapor apparel shirts, uh, they actually have you know specific instructions of how to print and press their shirts, and you really should follow those. Um, are downloadable templates for products available for Illustrator? Um, yeah, you can you can probably because of the fact that they do have some generic files, you shouldn't have any problem with that. How do you show the image stays in line when you heat press, especially odd shaped blanks? First of all, we normally do make the heat transfer a little bit larger whenever the thing is. It gives us a margin of error. Second, on hard items, we typically use heat tape. Just a little piece of it. it looks like scotch tape. Don't ever get it too confused. Um, when we're doing apparel, believe it or not, we can use a very, very light spray of repositional textile adhesive so that it holds it in place on the shirt. I know that sounds like it would never work. It works. And okay, it's kind of scary almost. Yeah. I was actually telling a, a, a temporary spray adhesive that you use for applique for embroidery yep. would at, work on this as well. Yes. But only on apparel. It doesn't work so good when you're doing hard items, but if you're doing apparel, Spray a very light bit on the apparel and then put the um, the transfer down and it'll hold it right okay, in place while we're pressing it. Yep. Very, very light though. That's the key. Okay. Good to know. Just scanning through. Uh, there's a ton of questions. I'm going to have to cut it off here in a minute because we're really down to 1.30. Um, yeah. And I'm sure everybody has other things going on. So what I want to do at this point, though, is I know there's a lot of great questions here. And, and my apologies, you know, we ran a little long, or Jimmy ran a little long, okay? And um, we didn't get to all your questions. And your questions are important. You see my email address on the screen. You see Colleen's on the screen. You know, just email directly to us, okay? And we'll be glad to, you know, help answer these questions for you and get back to you. Um, and, again, my apologies that we didn't get to them, but... Um, I do appreciate everyone participating, and I do appreciate all the questions you have because that's important to, to help you learn more. Now, a couple of things real quick before we sign off. Uh, there are some trade shows coming up that I'll be at that you may or may not be at. I'm just going to briefly mention. Um, I'll be at the DAX show in Minneapolis next weekend. I'm actually doing a class on sublimation. And if you're at that show, yeah, that class is on Saturday morning. It's free to attend. Uh, come join us for that class because I'll have a lot of my samples there and, and I'll be there to answer questions you know, about the process and show you some stuff. Uh, if you're going to DAX in Chicago, which that's not until um, when April, April 27th, 28th. Again, give them the same class there. And the ISS show in Columbus. I'm doing several classes there, one on poly performance apparel, one on sublimation versus DTG. Uh, so, you know, come see me there. And... Then I'll be at the NBM show. And, you know, I go to all the shows, okay? Just trust I'll be there. But, you know, I always encourage you to come by because if you want to ask some things one-on-one, -on -one, see some samples in the hand and all. You know, I'm there to help you with that. So um, I guess we got to wrap up, though, don't we, Carl, uh, Colleen? Yeah, I w we do. And we'll be also at the DAX show in Chicago and the ISS in Columbus So and probably the print we're in Indianapolis. So. Yeah, I'll be there Please too. Please feel free to stop by the booth and ask any questions if you like. Um, Madeira is offering the the Rico printer, the uh, the cartridges for the chroma, the um, sublimation ink, uh, and the paper. So we should be able to put a package together, which you will get an email about at a nice price. So if you want to uh, make an, a small investment into uh, increasing the revenue for your business through sublimation, uh, we would be happy to serve you to do that. Um, like Jimmy said, my email address is on there. Um, I'll be happy to answer any questions that I can, uh, and uh, I promise to get back with you. And well, thanks uh, again for well, uh, thanks for having me here and and you know dominating you with my cough. But um, you know, if anybody wants to watch back on the video, the cough will be gone, uh, magically cured. Okay, through the power of editing. So with that said, I guess it's give us 24 hours to, yes. to get you, you uh, better. Yes, and, yes. Uh, we'll have that out there for you all to see again if you like. Yep. So uh, we'll see you guys next time.